Good evening and welcome. Uh, I hope that uh, all of you noticed the special music that was playing uh, just before the start of the lecture. Uh, this was music composed by Penka Kuneva and is from her album, The Woman Asked Net. I had the very good fortune last year of uh, seeing this performed in person at the Hollywood Bowl uh, during the American Space event, which also showcased uh, Caltech and JPL's accomplishments in space exploration. Thank you, Penka, for your gift of music for these lectures. So I am Tom Prince, Bowen Professor of Physics at Caltech and Director of the WM Keck uh, Institute for Space Studies. So what is the Keck Institute? Uh, many of you already know, but for those of you who don't, we are a think tank for new ideas about space exploration working jointly with Caltech's uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And what we do is we bring together the best scientists and engineers from the US, from Pasadena, and from around the world to participate in our studies. We are very grateful to the WMM Keck Foundation for their past support uh, uh, of our institute and to the Caltech Space Innovation Council and other friends of Caltech for their current generous support of the Keck Institute. Of course, we are, we, we've been living through with the impact of the pandemic, but let me tell you about one positive impact and that is the lecture series. Uh, previously, our Keck Institute talks were held in one of Caltech's uh, lecture halls with perhaps 100 to 150 attendees. Some of these were great lectures, for instance, how to apply origami techniques to spacecraft design but the audience was limited. Because of the pandemic, of course, we need to go virtual and the results have been just great. The attendance at the lectures uh, grew to over 500 and in one case, I uh, got to over uh, 2000 uh, people. Uh, I see that the numbers are climbing right now and it's already at 400 for this lecture. Uh, topics of our lectures included the recent launch, recently launched Mars 2020 mission, the exciting Lunar Trailblazer mission, and the amazing future Dragonfly, Dragonfly mission to Titan. Uh, by the way, uh, I talked about the music and uh, hearing it uh, for the first time at the Hollywood Bowl. We took our KISS affiliates to the event at the Hollywood Bowl last year, and they told us that the music and that uh, performance was one of the highlights of the, their program for last year. So who are the affiliates? I think I've talked about them before at these lectures. One of our goals of, at the Keck Institute is to develop the next generation of space scientists and engineers. And so therefore the affiliates program is a group of talented Caltech graduate students and postdocs with special interest and space science and engineering. The affiliates come together uh, for a virtual pizza now, once a month, to hear a talk by a prominent space scientist or engineer, just as we are doing tonight. So I'd like to now call on one of the leads of the affiliates groups, that's Nikita Yadlapali, who will be your host this evening. Nikita is a third year graduate student working with Professor Vikram Ravi. Her research interests lie in radio instrumentation, and she currently works on a new instrument called Sprite at Owens Valley Radio Observatory. Outside of research, she's currently the president of, for Caltech's Women in Physics, Math, and Astronomy group. And her free time, uh, yes, graduate students do have free time, uh, she enjoys hiking, rock climbing, and baking. So Nikita, uh, take it away. Thanks, Tom, for the introduction, and thanks, everybody, for attending our lecture tonight. So like Tom said, I'm Nitika, and I'm a third-year graduate student, and I'm really excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Greg Hallinan. Professor Hallinan started his astronomy career at the National University of Ireland, where he earned both his bachelor's degree and a PhD. He then moved to UC Berkeley as a Jansky Fellow, after which, in 2012, he joined the Caltech Astronomy Department as a professor. So while Professor Hallinan has been at Caltech, he's been the PI of a number of really awesome groundbreaking missions. So at Palomar Observatory, Professor Hallinan led a high-speed optical camera called Chimera, 
which saw first light in 2014 and is installed on the Hale 200 inch telescope. Around this time, Professor Hallinan also started and now currently leads two radio telescopes at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory. These projects are the Deep Synoptic Array, which finds and localizes fast radio bursts and the Long Wavelength Array, which is a fast all sky, low frequency telescope. Professor Hallinan's future projects include the DSA 2000, a 2000 dish radio array to be placed, uh, um, excuse me, a 2000 dish radio array to be the first radio camera and far side, a low frequency array to be placed on the far side of the moon, which is what we're going to hear about in today's lecture. Professor Hallinan's main science interests include searching for radio emission from brown dwarves and exoplanets as a way to understand the magnetic field activity around these objects. He also studies fast and slow radio transients detected by the VLA and was also involved in observing the radio afterglow of the 2017 neutron star merger detected by LIGO. On top of all of this, Professor Hallinan has also served as the director for the Owens Valley Radio Observatory since 2019 and is a really wonderful teacher and advisor to many students at Caltech. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Hallinan to speak about his project Farside. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I am here to talk about Farside. Um, and Farside is a concept for a probe mission to place a low frequency radio array on the lunar far side. Why would we want to do that? Well, it turns out that's the best place uh, in the inner solar system to try to do some of the science that's kind of shown on the right hand side. In particular, trying to detect the magnetospheres of exoplanets uh, and also trying to probe the very early universe, the so-called dark ages. And before I begin, I really want to give thanks to so many people who have made this mission a possibility. Um, first and foremost, foremost, Jack Burns, who uh, also leads the project, um, and all the team here who kind of define the science, and many of us are part of the Network for Exploration and Space Science. Um, the unmatched team at JPL, uh, led by Larry Teitelbaum, who have put in a huge amount of work uh, to make this happen, and thanks to, to Jeff Booth for enabling so much of the work that's happened. Um, Blue Origin um, have come on board in the last year and really opened our eyes to how to do this uh, with, their, with, their, with their Blue Moon Lander, and that's been fantastic. And from my personal side, I want to thank also Dave Thompson and Tony Elias, who provided some really important feedback and direction about how to do this very early on in the design process. Now, I want to also thank uh, Joe Lazio, Jenny Skolnick, Michelle Judd, uh, and Tom Prince and the, and the KISS gang, because a lot of the ideas for Fireside did evolve from a KISS workshop, as is often the case for, for some of the exciting new missions that are happening today. This is a, this is a, a, Keck, uh, a, a KISS workshop we had in 2013 and 2015 that really explored how you would try to detect the magnetic fields for exoplanets. And really, I'm going to initially try to explain how we came to the decision to design Fireside based on this science case. And what you'll see is that when you build an array for that science case, you can do a whole lot more. Before I can talk about extrasolar planets and extrasolar space weather, I want to give some background context talking about uh, our own space weather. And of course, our space weather is defined by the sun. The sun uh, produces two types of activity that particularly dominate our space weather. We have flares caused by magnetic reconnection. When magnetic fields become tw twisted and trapped and reconnect, and you, you see a lot of high energy radiation in X-rays and UV. Now, very often associated with the largest flares, but not exclusively so, you see very large CMEs, coronal mass ejections. That's when 100 billion tons of plasma is spewed out from the sun at many hundreds of kilometers per second. And sometimes those CMEs come in our direction and they dominate our local space weather. This particular coronal mass ejection in September 2017, in fact, did produce a, a geomagnetic storm. It was a G4 class severe storm. And it's just one example. Uh, over the last few hundred years, there are examples where uh, there has been loss of power. There have been, in the last few decades, there have been examples where satellites are under threat uh, due to this kind of space weather. So it's very important to monitor. Now, on much longer time scales, however, it can have a more severe uh, impact on planetary atmospheres. So here's a, an artist's impression of young Mars, which we now know was a lot warmer and wetter than, than it is today. Now, the sun's activity can impact planetary atmospheres. Um, solar flares over giga years produce high X-ray and UV flux and can impact the atmospheres of planets via photoionization. 
And then you've got particle flux, both from CMEs, but also from what we call solar energetic particle events. And they can erode the atmosphere directly via processes like ion pickup. Now it's been claimed by uh, the MAVEN mission uh, by Tchaikovsky et al that CMEs in fact, from when the sun was very active when it was very young, may have been responsible for the evolution of Mars to its current day state. Uh, now, there are also theories that Venus, which does have a very thick, dense atmosphere, but it's very low in content uh, in water, for example. Uh, it's been theorized that water content may have been re removed by a similar process. One distinction of Earth between these other two planets, of course, is that it currently has a large and stable magnetic field, which may play a role in protecting that atmosphere. That being said, the jury is out. Um, lots of the studies in the last few years have shown that the level of atmospheric loss experienced at Earth is no less than that experienced at Mars. So what we need is more data and more planets, uh, more terrestrial planets and other solar systems to understand this relationship. And moving out to other stars, uh, where I wanna start off is by looking at demographics of stars in the solar neighborhood. This is just showing uh, the breakdown of stars within about eight parsecs, about 26 light years, by spectral type. And that's a spectral type as a proxy for color and temperature. Hotter stars are on the left and cooler, fainter stars on the right. And the sun is a G dwarf. Now you often hear the term, the sun is an average star. Well, if you look at the demographics, it's actually much larger than average. Most stars are cooler. And in fact, the most populous population are these ones right here, so-called red dwarfs or M dwarfs. For every G dwarf in our galaxy, there are 20 M dwarfs. And M dwarfs are a really big focus for uh, ventures to try to detect directly signatures, for example, of um, atmospheres with uh, biosignatures, uh, evidence for life. Uh, why is that? Well, we just learned that they dominate uh, demographics for stars. And it turns out that rocky planets in particular are very frequent around M dwarfs. So these small stars, have lots of small planets. And that of course is other, these are the kind of planets we wanna, we wanna search for, for life and eventually biosignatures. Okay, uh, if you look at the demographics, the nearest candidate habitable planet likely orbits an M dwarf within a few parsecs, okay? We only know of a small fraction of the nearby planets orbiting M dwarfs and missions like TESS that's ongoing will hopefully find a lot more. Okay, here's a couple of examples that are pretty famous of M dwarfs that have rocky bodies uh, of the right size and distance to be candidates for being in the habitable zone, which is defined as being the right distance for liquid water. On the top, I'm showing TRAPPIST-1, which is a tiny star with a system of seven rocky planets, three of which are at the right distance for uh, liquid water, we think. And of course, our nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, which is barely a parasitic away, uh, is also now known to have a small rocky body operating, uh, um, orbiting at the right distance for liquid water. So that all sounds very rosy. M dwarfs are um, uh, the future of exoplanet studies. But there is a catch, and that is that M dwarfs uh, are very active. So I showed the sun producing a flare and a CME in an earlier movie. Turns out that M dwarfs flare extremely frequently, and they flare to much higher energies on average than we see for the sun. Uh, by way of example, I'm going to show a movie um, comparing a flare on the sun and this little tiny runt of a star called DGCVN, which is an M dwarf at 60 light years distance. Its luminosity is 1000 that of the sun. And yet in 2014, it produced a huge flare. How big? This flare from this small M dwarf triggered a gamma ray satellite orbiting earth. Uh, basically that gamma ray satellite thought a huge explosion had happened in that direction. Let's try to put uh, uh, or classify that flare. The largest flare seen on the sun in the last century has been uh, this flare in November, uh, November 2003, it was X45. This flare, the small star was X100,000 on a linear scale. So thousands of times more energetic than the flare we see in the sun, the largest flare we've seen on the sun. It was huge. Now, what makes this worse is when you look at where the habitable zone is around stars. So for a star like the sun, a G dwarf, the habitable zone is by definition one AU. We reside at that distance, right? 
uh, as you go down and, and you have cooler stars, you have to be closer in to have the same level of immolation, to have the same essentially temperature for liquid water. And for M dwarfs, you have to be at a very small fraction of the distance, a small fraction of an AU. And that means you're, you're experiencing a much larger dose of that radiation from that flare. In fact, it's that ratio of distance squared, more radiation times X thousand times more uh, for, for the flare being much larger. So overall, it's pretty bad news. And what's been established in the last few years is that even stars that look inactive, so M dwarfs that are slow rotators, that are basically, by all other metrics, inactive, can still produce very large flares. Another factor is the activity lifetime. So it turns out the sun, when it was a young star, was very active. In fact, it produced huge flares, probably even larger than M dwarfs. But what drove that activity was rapid rotation. The rotation of the sun was very fast, and that drove a dynamo, which generates very large magnetic fields, and that drives activity to be very high. Because activity is very high, and the, and the solar wind was very high, it lost angular momentum, and it spun down. It slowed down in its rotation. That happened very fast, within a few million years. M dwarves, by comparison, take much longer to, slow, to, to, to spin down and slow down. Here I'm showing the activity lifetime for M dwarfs going from the largest M dwarfs to the coolest M dwarfs. Here it's about half a solar mass down to about 0.1 solar masses. And what we see is that as you get to the cooler M dwarfs, they can take billions of years to spin down and become less active. So your orbiting planets are exposed to a higher level of radiation from larger flares for a much longer time. We have lots of data on flares. The big unsolved mystery for M dwarfs is, is do these M dwarfs produce coronal mass ejections? Do they also produce very large amounts of particle flux that impacts uh, the atmospheres of those planets? So try to capture that. Here's a picture of an M dwarf with an orbiting rocky planet. And we theorize that they produce CMEs. And I have two questions. Are those CMEs uh, as large or in proportion to the very large flares we see in M dwarfs? And secondly, do rocky planets orbiting M dwarfs have large scale magnetic fields like the Earth has? And do those magnetic fields play a role in shielding the atmosphere from the activity of a star? Uh, one way we can probe this is by trying to detect CMEs and planetary magnetic fields with radio telescopes. Okay. And in particular, I'm talking about a couple of phenomena. When the sun produces a large CME, you typically see a type of radio burst called a type two radio burst. That is a signature of a CME that we think can be seen for nearby stars. Secondly, all the planets in our solar system that have strong magnetic fields produce bright radio emission associated with the same electrons that give you the aurora. And that radio emission is very powerful because we can measure directly how strong those fields are. Let's look at these in turn. So on the left, I'm showing a, a movie of a CME. And what you see is on the right is um, a dynamic spectrum that shows frequency on the y-axis and time in hours on the left, on the uh, x-axis. When you have a CME, you have a huge burst of radio emission and it sweeps through the time frequency plane, going from high to low frequencies. What's happening is that radio emission is generated, it's, uh, it traces density, okay? And as the CME propagates outwards, it goes to lower density, and therefore the radio emission propagates to lower frequencies. So you have this characteristic sweep across the time frequency plane. That is a type two radio burst. That is our signature to try to find this phenomenon for other stars. How bright can a type two radio burst be? Well, we only have one star thus far for which we have a sample to look at. And the brightest burst that's ever been seen was seen in 1947. At the time, the largest sunspot group ever seen in the sun was present. Here it is shown on the uh, Sun with Jupiter's uh, uh, with the size of Jupiter and Earth for scale. It was huge. 
it covered about 0.6% of the solar uh, surface. And this particular sunspot region was associated with a huge flare uh, uh, and an associated CME and a very bright radio burst. That radio burst was the brightest extraterrestrial radio emission ever detected. It was 10 to the 11 Janskis. Janskis is a unit used in radio astronomy and a Jansky source is actually quite a bright source. A 10 to the 11 Jansky source is enormously bright and would easily be bright enough to detect with any antenna you want to plug into a um, spectrum analyzer. Uh, a spoon or a piece of wire will easily pick up that source. If we happen to be observing the sun from a nearby star at that exact time, with the same kind of telescopes that we use on Earth right now, we would see that, th that burst very easily. And yes, we have never seen this phenomenon for other stars. And there's a reason for that. And that is because how we go about this thus far has been sort of incorrect. We need a paradigm shift in how we do stellar radio astronomy for this kind of phenomenon. We need panop panoptic uh, astronomy. When I say panoptic, I mean seeing the entire sky all at once. And why is that? Well, let's look at the case of how we monitor the sun's activity. It's space weather. We have a whole suite of telescopes from the radio to the uh, infrared, optical, UV, X-ray, and gamma rays on the ground and in space that are all trained on the sun uh, whenever it's above the horizon or permanently viewed from space. So the idea of observing a star for a few hours at a time to try to find this phenomena doesn't hold water. We have to do the same kind of monitoring capability that we have for the sun for these other stars. And that's what I mean by panoptic. If you observe all the sky all at once uh, with a radio telescope, you can actually pick out all the nearby stars and monitor them for these kind of type two light bursts. Now, there's another phenomenon we see when you have a CME impact uh, the local space environment of Earth, um, and that is a geomagnetic storm. So I've already described this briefly at the start of the talk. Here's a cartoon showing a CME uh, leaving the surface of the sun, traveling at 1,000 kilometers per second, finally reaches Earth after about a day or so, day and a half, compresses the Earth's magnetic field, which causes it to reconnect it reconnects the daytime side and the nighttime side, and then you have electrons spirating in into the upper atmosphere. And those electrons collide with the upper atmosphere and ionize oxygen and they ionize nitrogen. And we have that lovely phenomenon we call the aurora. Those same electrons, it turns out, produce a very powerful radio emission at low radio frequencies. In the case of Earth, it's called terrestrial kilometric radiation, okay? It is incredibly luminous. It is 10 to the four times more luminous than any terrestrial radio emission we produce via aircraft radar, for example. Uh, it wasn't discovered until the 1950s because it turns out this radio emission is at too low a frequency to pass through our atmosphere because our ionosphere, our outer atmosphere is ionized and prevents radio waves below a certain frequency from propagating through the atmosphere. This radio emission is also highly variable. Here is a plot that shows the amount of power on the, on the y-axis as a function of frequency on the x-axis. You can see the median uh, flux density of um, the Earth here. But 1% of the time, it can increase by hundreds of factors of a, of a few hundred in its radio luminosity. When does this happen? Well, during a CME, for example when you have a much larger input of solar wind on the Earth's magnetosphere. Once again, this is a fairly rare phenomenon. And it kind of, once again, speaks to the paradigm shift of needing to have continuous monitoring of lots of systems to capture this phenomenon. Now, it's not just Earth that's a radio source. Like I mentioned before, every planet in our solar system that has a magnetic field produces this bright radio waves. Here I'm showing uh, the flux density normalized to the distance of four AU as a function of frequency. And you can see all of the planets, uh, this includes Jupiter, Earth, uh, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn. Now, Uranus, uh, Jupiter was discovered as a radio source in the 1950s. Earth 
uh, in the 1950s, 1960s actually, when we flew satellites over the auroral uh, regions, Uranus, Neptune, and Saturn were not discovered as radio sources until Voyager. The reason for that is because of this dashed line. The radio emission from all these planets is the frequency de we detect the radio emission at, at is proportional to the magnetic field of the planet. Let's take the example of Jupiter. Jupiter has the strongest magnetic field of the planets in our solar system, about 14 Gauss, which means its radio emission cuts off at about 40 megahertz. It's very bright. It can outshine the sun most of the time at radio frequencies. And a single dipole in your backyard can pick up the bursts of radio emission that come from Jupiter. For the rest of the planets, they are below 10 megahertz. And 10 megahertz is an important frequency. That, uh, that is the cutoff below which you cannot detect uh, radio emission from the ground. And that is why it took Voyager to detect the radio emission from Uranus, um, Saturn, and Neptune. So really, for certain magnetic fields, you can get them from the ground with a small dipole. For the rest, you have to go to space. And to reinforce that, it's because of our atmosphere. Our atmosphere has certain transmission windows. The obvious one, of course, is in the visible, which is why our eyes are evolved to be optimized for visible. The infrared um, and in the radio. And down at about um, 20 meters um, or 30 meters, which is about 10 megahertz, you have this cutoff caused by the fact that our outer atmosphere is ionized and won't let radiation pass through. So when we look for radio emission from other stars with, with the rays in the ground, we're looking typically for more massive planets, uh, as well as brown dwarfs, which are like the bigger cousins of planets. And we found many examples of brown dwarfs um, that produce aurora like the planets do that confirm but this process is not unique to our solar system and allows us to measure very accurately how strong the magnetic fields are for brown dwarfs. We've even gone as far as finding a very cool object uh, that is about 12.7 Jupiter masses. Here's its phone number name. This particular object was very exciting. We first thought it was a brown dwarf and later it became clear that it may in fact be a planetary mass brown dwarf. That is an object right on the edge of the boundary between planets and brown dwarfs that is free floating, does, uh, does not have a parent star. And this work was done as part of uh, the graduate thesis of Melody Cow at Caltech and she's now a Hubble Fellow at ASU. So we're finding these objects that are, that are heavier, but for, to go after the, the, the smaller rocky planets, we have to go to very low frequencies, which means going to space. And you can kind of ask, what are the requirements? Well, first of all, you need a huge collecting area. Jupiter can outshine the sun at low frequencies, but Jupiter is very nearby. Uh, the radio emission we see from the planets is very faint at the distance of nearby stars. You need an enormous collecting area. And the catch is, if you want to get rocky planets, it's got to be in space. And somehow it has to monitor thousands of systems simultaneously to, to be, be able to, you know, rely on that probability of getting that rare event uh, by monitoring lots of them simultaneously. Not very easy, uh, it turns out, but it, um, in fact, it's not as difficult as it was perceived to be when we first approached the problem. Let's first examine what kind of antenna you could put in space to do this. We need lots and lots of collecting area. Your immediate kind of reaction might be, well, that means a huge dish. This is the Green Bank Telescope. It is the largest steerable dish on the planet Earth. Um, it is not in either Washington or New York, it's just shown here for scale. Um, and it's, it's an enormous structure. It's actually one of the wonders of the world in terms of its mechanical design. It weighs 7.7 .7 million kilograms. I'm pretty sure we're not putting this in space anytime soon. So what's our alternative? Well, it turns out we do have an alternative. We can put a very simple antenna called a dipole in space instead. And the reason why we can do that for these science cases in particular is because of how the sensitivity of these antennas depends on the frequency you're observing at or the wavelength. In particular, a dish has a collecting area, uh, sorry, has a sensitivity that is proportional to its collecting area, okay? Which is pi r squared, where r is its radius, okay? 
So it has a fixed collecting area. It's a big bucket that collects radio photons, okay? It turns out dipoles are different. The sensitivity of a dipole is actually proportional to wavelength and inversely proportional to frequency, okay? It is not a fixed number. It depends on what frequency or wavelength you're observing at. And I'm gonna plot sensitivity for these two antennas uh, on a curve. Here we have collecting area or effective collecting area meter squares squared, and here we have frequency. Now the collecting area of the dish is unchanging as a function of frequency, but look at the dipole. If you're observing up here at gigahertz frequencies, you need million, uh, you need like a million dipoles to be as sensitive as green bank. But if you go down to low frequencies, especially those that are accessible from space, it turns out a single dipole can suddenly become extremely sensitive compared to a dish. And in fact, in the kind of band we're after for habitable exoplanets, a dipole is more sensitive than green bank and it weighs a lot less. So it makes a lot more sense to put your dipole in space than your big dish. This applies for even bigger dishes. This is the fast radio telescope in China, the 500, aperture, 500 meter aperture spherical telescope. It is huge and still in the exoplanet band, it's, much, it's, it's, a, it's a toss up between a simple dipole and this huge dish for sensitivity. So it turns out our, our answer is to put dipoles in space. And it turns out the lunar far side is the way to do it because once you go into space, there are other sources of noise you have to worry about. Um, one big source of noise is plasma noise. And if you're below about a megahertz in the inner solar system, that plasma noise can prevent you from being as sensitive as those big dishes. Well, it turns out on the lunar uh, surface, on the nighttime side, there is a cavity where your low plasma density allows you to have that full sensitivity. Um, and that really is the advantage of the far side of the moon um, or the lunar surface in general. It allows you to have a, a plasma cavity where you can have this enormous sensitivity for every dipole you put there. Why we're putting it on the lunar far side and not the lunar near side is due to um, isolation from Earth. Turns out humans are pretty noisy. And as well as humans being noisy, we just learned that the Earth is a bright radio source. And the best place to get away from that is to go to the far side of the moon. And it turns out you can get a huge amount of isolation from interference and from Earth's radio mission on the lunar far side. Here actually is a study done um, by Jack Burns' team uh, in 2020 that shows exactly how much um, isolation you can get on the lunar far side, right down at these low radio frequencies where we wanna actually do this experiment. For example, inside this uh, solid black circle on the lunar far side, you can get a factor of 100 million suppression of the noise from the Earth at our frequency of interest. We've also done a study to see where is the best place to put that array to do exoplanet uh, science. I worked with an excellent high school student uh, this year called Jonathan Bargesi, and he did this really nice study to, to, to try to assess what uh, lunar latitude we should place our array in order to be able to maximally detect all of the nearby planets that we know of that may be uh, um, sources of radio emission. And it turns out somewhere near the, um, the equator uh, in the Southern region is probably our best bet for both RFI and, max and being maximally sensitive to exoplanets. Okay, with all that background, we approached this problem in 2018 of trying to design um, the, the far side array. Um, a probe study was uh, commenced with JPL as an access center. One of 10 probe studies being done that were, that were done as part of the, the decadal review process for astronomy. Um, we worked with TMEX in JPL, which is JPL's crack team of engineers to try to get you inside a nice box where cost and mass is feasible. And that was an amazing experience and they really got us in, in, in uh, ship shape and we ended up with a design for a rover and a base station and our instruments 
by April 2019. Our white paper was submitted in July 2019, and you can see it online. And our final probe study report, which is a much larger document, was submitted uh, later that year. Now, in the last year, we've actually reapproached the design and done a lot more optimization. And that's thanks to a commencement of a JPL Blue Origin partnership. Uh, and really looking at the Blue Moon lander and how best we can work inside the framework of that lander. And recently, we also submitted our white paper for the planetary science decade review. Okay. Uh, we also were able to. Um, draw on heritage from existing projects. We didn't start from scratch. In particular, I want to highlight two arrays. One is called Sunrise. Sunrise is a project led by Justin Casper uh, uh, and project scientist is Joe Lazio at, at JPL. And it's a six CubeSat, um, uh, six small sat array uh, that's going to actually be the first proper interferometer in space uh, looking at the sun trying to detect these same kind of radio bursts we're, we're detecting from other stars with far side. It's a loose formation of six, uh, six U satellites and they will have a maximum separation of 10 kilometers, essentially acting like a giant dish. And they operate in very similar frequencies that we hope to operate for far side. And Sunrise will launch all things going well in 2023, which is very exciting. The other array, array that we we're, we're drawing on was called, is called the Owens Valley Radio Observatory Long Wavelength Array. This is an, is an array of dipoles in the Owens Valley. Uh, in fact, at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, which is managed by Caltech. And this array of antennas is, in a, is a very similar architecture to what we want to build on the far side of the moon, both in terms of the hardware used, how the antennas are deployed uh, across a large area, uh, and in terms of their central processing system, okay? So we had, a lot, we had a lot of heritage there. This array is actually being used for the same kind of science, try to detect exoplanets, but more the focus on larger exoplanets. And it's currently undergoing a very large upgrade. So with that all in our, in our back pocket, we, we, we went about our, 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 our design, and here was what the design looked like at the end of our probe study in November, 2019. It consists of a lander with a single deployment rover uh, that had tether reels that would, and will deploy these tethers out across a 10 kilometer area. Along these tethers, you have uh, small instruments that, are, that consist of dipoles and electronics. And those dipoles deploy uh, as the uh, uh, tether is drawn out, okay? Uh, the array will span a 10 kilometer area on the lunar far side, and the, and the, the rover dr uh, will dr drive out with one tether at a time, deploying antennas, and then returning back into the base station, and then so on, forming this petal configuration, okay? Along the way, it will do this kind of zigzag pattern because one of the dipole um, components is actually a wire embedded in the science tether. The second antenna is a stacer that deploys after the uh, um, tether is, is drawn out. You can see this sort of happening in this kind of movie here, which shows um, our lander with our, our large rover deploying and pulling out the uh, science tether behind it. And this is a video created uh, from the University of Colorado with Jack Burns team. And you can see as the uh, instrument deploys, each of these stacers pops out um, slowly. The other polarization is actually embedded in the tether. Power for the base station is provided by these two nuclear EMM RTGs. And our base station includes all the electronics for processing the signals, power, uh, telecom, command and data handling, et cetera. What do the data look like? Well, it will look something like this. This is an all sky movie from the Avro LWA team uh, made by Marin Anderson. The far side array will do the exact same all sky imaging, but a factor of a hundred lower in frequency. Really down where you can go after these, these rocky planets. Here is the location of every rocky, of every um, M dwarf is the red dot and every F, G or K dwarf is the yellow dot that will be above the sky. And we'll be able to monitor all of those continuously. Now, 
Farsight would generate data for 1,400 channels covering a very wide frequency range. It will collect that data every 60 seconds and send that back to Earth. The data rate is about 65 gigabytes of data per day. How does it get back? In our baseline design, we assume that there will be a lunar gateway in orbit. So what is a lunar gateway? The lunar gateway is actually a concept for a lunar space station. And it's a key component of the Artemis program currently being developed by NASA, okay? And we're assuming that a two-way link between Earth and far side via, via the lunar gateway will provide our data relay capability. We have also investigated the alternative concept of having a dedicated uh, relay that is actually deployed during the lander, uh, 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 as the lander um, descends. That may be the more likely eventual solution. There will be another orbiting uh, uh, small sat for the uh, far side array. And that, uh, that orbiting uh, uh, small satellite will be a calibration beacon. We will have an array spread across 10 kilometers and we will have our dipoles and our tethers pulled out by a rover. The final location of all the, the wire on the ground that forms our array is where our, our, our science is very sensitive to the location of those, uh, those wires, those dipoles. This orbiting beacon will actually allow us to measure that very precisely. And we have a two-stage design for this orbiting beacon involving demonstration in Earth orbit followed by um, the actual final satellite deploying from the far side uh, uh, mission itself. Okay, here's what the timeline and budget looks like for our, our baseline design that we had at the start of this year. Um, we hope for launch in 2027. And the key thing is the total cost is about $1.3 billion. Our mass is quite substantial and it became very clear very fast that the best solution we had for a lander was uh, the Blue Moon Lander from Blue Origin. And about a year ago, um, Dave Thompson connected us with uh, the Blue Origin team. And in the last uh, year or so, we, we began collaborating and actually planning how to actually modify our design to better suit the Blue Moon Lander. And that process has been going on for the last few months and has really changed how we go about doing this array. So I've shown you what our design was at the start of the year, um, and I wanna show how our design has changed to highlight how much uh, it has helped to integrate with the Blue Moon team and, and actually try to design our project around the lander. So first, uh, just wanna describe the process we went, we went through in the last few months. We had a, a, another study at JPL, um, and we had a collaboration between JPL, Blue Origins, and, and, and our science lead team. And it really changed a lot of the array. Um, first and foremost, look at the configuration now. It is now a spiral pattern rather than a, uh, uh, a petal pattern. And instead of having one rover, we now have four rovers. And in particular, we have these four telerobotic JPL axle rovers. That was very important for us. In our previous design, we had one rover, uh, and that was because of the limitation we had in time for the design process initially. That one rover, let, that one rover meant we had one very big single point of failure in our design. And it also meant the rover had to operate through lunar day and lunar night. Uh, now with these four axle rovers, they can all deploy tethers simultaneously. And we have a lot more uh, redundancy in our design. If one rover fails, we can still do most of our science. What's also very important is in the previous design, we had one polarization, one of the dipoles embedded in the tether and the other was this space antenna that, that deploys out. Now both polarizations are actually in the, are in the tether. And that gives us a lot more sensitivity, a lot more robustness for science. The entire arch architecture of the, of the mission was revisited to, to fit around this new um, concept for the rovers and for the, for the instrument itself, which has also been redesigned. And this kind of shows uh, the, the kind of cartoon now of the lander with our four axle rovers on top uh, and how they will, de how they will uh, deploy off the, the top of the lander uh, in a very different design than what we had last year. These um, axle rovers are amazing. Um, they're, like I said, they're telebotically controlled. 
They're quite large, and each one will have a single spool that will control that will that will have the um, the power, the uh, the data comms, and the instruments all built in and deployed simultaneously. One really important part of this is that this new spiral pattern that we have, like I said, gives a lot more robustness. What we what I'm showing here is what our array uh, point spread function looks like. So a point spread function is just your resolution element for the full array. <clears throat> it turns out that we have a very nice point spread function when we have these four spiral arms. But now, thanks to this new design, if one spiral arm fails, our point spread function will only, will only vary by a few percent. So we really actually have a lot of our um, design sensitivity even in the event of a failure. So we've gone through this amazing redesign process. We're much more robust, and I think we're a much more efficient design. What does it all mean for our, our science case of looking for exopaths? What I'm showing here is the, the, the median flux density of all the nearby exoplanets uh, that we know of that are small and rocky and orbiting M dwarfs. And here, this gray line tells us how sensitive we are after two and a half thousand hours of observing with the far side array. We have, for each of these objects, we, we have a circle, a, a square, uh, and, a, and a diamond. And that corresponds for different, to different models for the, the stellar wind. We have very little data on how M dwarves reduce a stellar wind. The more dense the stellar wind, the brighter the exoplanet's radio emission will be. What we can see is that we can detect a small number of nearby rocky planets uh, with far side in its, um, in its long integrations measuring the average radio emission from these planets. What's more exciting is because we're imaging the entire sky, we're now able to do this um, uh, monitoring for when these planets light up in the same way the Earth does. And in this scenario, in just two hours or two and a half hours of observations, we can detect a much larger population. These are known planets are orbiting nearby M dwarfs. The unknown population is much larger and that will change over time. And really the picture we have is the idea of measuring these magnetospheres is to build a picture of comparative planetology understanding what are the important characteristics that govern whether or not a planet has an atmosphere and whether or not that, that atmosphere is conducive for life. So it's, quite, it's, it's a, we think, a key element in the next few decades uh, in our search for biosignatures. Um, I mentioned comparative planetology. I want to just quickly advertise that Caltech really has taken a holistic view of this comparative planetary evolution. And we have a center at Caltech with this particular focus. Um, so look that up and read all about it. Okay, I want to very quickly talk about some of the other science we can do uh, with Farside beyond exoplanets. The other, I think, most important science case I want to showcase is one of cosmology. It's very different to exoplanets, but it turns out our array is also very well designed for this science. Now, cosmology has gone through a number of keystone events in the last few decades primarily in the study of the cosmic microwave background, which is the background radiation that we have uh, from the Big Bang, uh, well, from 4,000 years after the Big Bang. The CMB has produced a number of phenomenal results and a couple of Nobel Prizes. We have also, thanks to telescopes like Hubble and Space, doing very deep uh, searches for supernova, the ability to measure the expansion of the universe and confirmed acceleration of expansion of the universe um, uh, and that leads to the theory of dark energy that also led to Nobel Prize. And cosmology is still a, a growing field rapidly. Between these two kind of eras where we have a lot of data, a lot, a lot, of, a lot the, the universe evolves to a lot of other epochs that we have no data on. Somehow the universe goes from a dark soup, uh, from a soup of neutral hydrogen to stars and galaxies. And it's very poorly understood how that can happen. Now, Farsight will offer the opportunity to probe this dark age period for the first time. How will it do that? Well, it turns out neutral hydrogen produces radio emission at a very particular wavelength, 21 centimeters, which is 1.4 gigahertz. Now, as we look further back, as we look further and further away, we're looking further back in time. 
through redshift. And it turns out we can trace further and further away or, or, or further back in time by tuning our radio telescopes to lower frequencies, okay? So this plot here uh, shows a, uh, a cartoon of the, um, the early universe from the, the dark ages post Big Bang and post CMB, CMB being emitted all the way through to galaxy formation, okay? And understanding how the universe and how the neutral hydrogen evolved over that period will, I think, resolve some very fundamental questions in cosmology. And all we're going to do is measure the temperature of hydrogen through this period. And in particular, we're going to try to measure it round about when we expect to have this big trough in the temperature of the neutral hydrogen relative to the CMB. And there are various models for how this trough will look. And these models are fundamental to understanding cosmology during this period. And Farside will do that. And by doing so, we hope we will have an emerging picture of how the very first stars and galaxies formed and how those stars and galaxies ionized that neutral hydrogen, reionized it, and formed the universe that we, we see today. Okay? It's essentially very similar to what we want to do or what, we, what, what has been done with CMB science. But CMB is one snapshot, 40,000 years after the Big Bang. With, with hydrogen, we can actually play a movie and watch the universe evolve from the dark ages all the way through the reionization and bridge that period that we, we don't understand. Our sensitivity is such that within 5,000 hours of integration time, at these low frequencies, we should have a five sigma detection of the dark ages signal. It requires very precise calibration of every dipole. And that's why we have this orbiting beacon concept. I wanna just very briefly mention some additional science that comes for free with our, with our array design. And one is um, heliophysics. Uh, we learn about, about sunrise launching and all the great science it's going to do. Well, far side will, we, will be successor to sunrise. And here's an example of an all sky image on the left from the Alvro LWA. And this is just showing the sun, which is this kind of this little pale dot right here, before a large coronal mass ejection, and here during a coronal mass ejection. In the plot, on the, in the image on the right, it's producing a type two radio burst. And it's so bright, we can't even see the rest of the sky. So we can use that data to trace and understand where particle acceleration happens in solar flares and CMEs. I'm showing an example here for the LWA by way of example. So on the right is a movie that shows um, that same radio burst in the previous slide. And on the left, I'm looking at data from the SOHO spacecraft where we see the optical CME. And what you see is before you ever see the CME showing up in the optical data, it's very clearly visible in the LWA data. Eventually, as it propagates outwards, we see the edge of the shock. Now, this kind of data is very important for tracing where particles are being accelerated and what's the density of plasma at the forward shock. <clears throat> Far side will be a factor of 100 lower in frequency, as will, as will sunrise be, and will trace these CMEs out to a much larger distance, resolving some very important questions. <clears throat> Then there's also solar system planets. We're looking for, for radio emission from other planets, uh, trying to detect radio emission. Well, it turns out our own planets, of course, are also viable targets. Here on the left is a, an image from Juno, from the JPL team in the IR, in the infrared, where you can see the aurora from Jupiter. The Juno mission also measures the radio emission from these aurora in situ, which answers very important questions about particle acceleration and the magnetic fields involved. Um, on the right, this is actually showing uh, an image of a lightning on Saturn. Turns out that same lightning event also produces radio emission, in this case detected by Cassini. These are detected by Juno and Cassini in situ. Far side will detect radio emission from the planets due to aurora and lightning, but from Earth orbit because it's so sensitive. Lastly, I want to mention one last science case that I think is really exciting. So uh, this is also something completely different. On the left here, I'm showing you a map of 
uh, fiber, optical fiber across Pasadena that's been used by a team led by Zhang Wenjian to do seismology, okay? Uh, using an amazing technique. And this same technique can, be, can make use of the optical fiber of Farsight. It's called distributed acoustic sensing and relies on imperfections in the fiber to be able to uh, measure very precisely um, the seismological properties under the ground. And the same technique, which is, is been used for Pasadena, will, will, will answer very key questions for um, the lunar um, core. It will, it, will, it will answer the question, what is the mantle structure and seismic activity at the far side? And answer, answer the question, is there a lunar liquid core? Which is an unanswered question. And it's an example of a science case that I would never have thought of for far side, but that Zhang Wenjian, when he, when he met with our team, um, thought had great potential, okay? So it's, it's uh, completely commensal. It will have a very small addition to the project, but will double the science return. Okay, I think at this point in time, I've covered enough various science cases. I'm gonna pause there and show a summary. Thank you very much.